ladies and gentlemen, here's something. I, I, I want you. I want you to listen to me very closely. I have a message for you: releasing the past and embrace, embracing the newness of life. The newness of life. And when you do that, you are willing to make a radical change on how you show up. When I was in pursuit of my goal and dream of becoming a motivational speaker, before I got any speaking engagements, I used to, and I'm talking about to be paid, I used to go to the shopping mall after walking around Belle Isle for about five or six times in Detroit, saying I'm the world's greatest orator. I wasn't being braggadocious. I hadn't even been paid to speak yet, but I was calling forth those things that be not as though they were. And, and then I would get dressed up and go to the shopping mall. And I want you to write this down, three feet principle, three feet principle. That I practice the three feet principle in that, <laughs> and that is, Talk to people. Write this down. I practice talk to people. I I will talk to anybody that got within three feet of me. Hi, my name is Les Brown, and I'm a motivational speaker. Do you or anyone you know that can use my services? And and if that doesn't work, guess what? I talk to more people. <laughs> It's called a TTP principle, a TTM principle. Write this down, TT, talk to people, and then talk to more people, TTMP. About your business, about your product, about the things that you want to do with your life and where you're going. And you have no idea on how that's going to manifest itself. You have no idea. If you just listen to me every day, I'm gonna give you something to do. You get an assignment, and and the assignment now is is talk to people. The TTMP, talk to more people, and we're gonna do this all virtually because I'm not going out to shop mall now. I don't go to shop mall. I'm in the house. I don't go anywhere. Tyrone and I, we stay in the house. We keep social distancing from each other. Well, if you didn't know, Tyrone is a squirrel that he taught me squirrely. We talk to each other every day. So, so back on point. And so therefore, you, you want to find ways to communicate and reach people and talk to a minimum of seven people every day about your goal, about your dream, and ask, do you or someone you know that will be helpful to me? Case in point, I was catching a plane from Detroit. I was living at the Riverfront Apartments to Chicago, and by maybe about five people on the plane. I sat by a guy named Lafayette Jones. I don't know what happened to Lafayette Jones. Somebody out there know Lafayette Jones. And we both were born on February the 17th. It's our birthday. I said, you born February 17th? He said, yes. I said, so was Michael Jordan and Jim Brown. He says, is that right? He said, what do you do? I said, I'm glad you asked. I'm a motivational speaker. I'm gonna become known and famous for that. Can you or someone you know use my services. He said, whoa. He said, man, I work for Robert Johnson, Johnson Products, and our speaker canceled. He said, are you good? I said, that's what people say. <laughs> he said, how much do you charge? At that time, I didn't know how much to charge. Listen to this, listen to me. Are you listening? I said, how much have you allocated? He said, $5,000. I looked at him. Is, 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 are you all right, brother? I said, did you say $5,000? He said, yes. Well, I didn't answer right away because I didn't want to speak in unknown tongues. <laughs> I never had $5,000 for 
a speech in my life. I got love offerings for $5 and $25 that showed that they didn't love you anymore. We love you, but Jesus loves you more. <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> so then, but I furthered the conversation. I said, Lafayette. I'm, I'm going to be on the Robert Shula show. He said, is that right? Yes, Millennials, this used to be a, a nationally televised ministry. He said, when? I said, I don't know exactly. Do you know Robert Shula or know someone who knows Robert Shula? He said, yes, my boss does. He gave him a million dollars for his ministry. I said, are you kidding? Now, mind you, I've been saying this and asking this question for two years. Did anybody that got within three feet of me, I would say I'm a speaker. Do you or someone you know can use my services? And I'm gonna be on the Robert Shula Show. Televised ministry. You got to call forth those things that be not as though they were. There's power, You, as a friend of mine, billionaire PA, speak your dream into existence. And, and he said, my boss knows him, Robert Johnson. I said, is that right? I did the event. I spoke. At the end, I got a standing ovation. And Mr. Johnson ran to the podium. He said, who are you? I said, I'm Les Brown, Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy. He said, man, you were good. You saved the day. He said, man, if I can ever do anything for you, let me know. I said, do you know Robert Shula? He said, yes, I gave a million dollars to his ministry. I said, I want to be on his program. He said, you got it. The next day at Riverfront Apartments, I got a phone call. Hello? Hi, this is Les Brown. This is Robert Shula. Robert Shula? Yes. Wow. Wow. Hold it just a minute. I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Put the phone down. Ready? It's number one. It's number one. Then I came back. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I was so excited. I was so excited. He said, I heard you're a very good speaker. I said, that's what people say. My mother taught me self-praise brings no recommendation. He said, I want you on my program. And he scheduled me and I went in and I did the show two different times. Listen to me. He got through 2020. He got through 2020. Against all odds, you showed up. You have favor with God. You showed up. There is something that you're supposed to do. And it's not the same thing you've been doing already. Make a radical change. All of us are the same way. The only thing that separates us are the choices and our behaviors. Listen to me. Our choices, our behavior, our habits. We'll be a team, a community of greatness, of people working on their goals and their dreams because you can't do it by yourself. Especially now, all this stuff that's going on right now, no. No, I cut my hair because I didn't want to see the same person in the mirror in 2021 that I saw in 2020, no. Uh-uh, no, I'm working on myself. Got on a scale and it was less of me today than yesterday because I'm serious. See, you got to be serious. Yeah, no, 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 no. You got to be serious. You got to hunker down. You've got to be anchored in your mind. And why? Because we don't know what's coming. Life is stalking us. Look behind and thank God. I want you to do that right now. Just look behind right now. Just reflect on this past year and your life. And you woke up this morning. You woke up. Just so many ways you could have been taken out. So today, I want you to visualize the goal that you want to achieve. Because the foundation, you got to build the foundation. But I want you 
to make a commitment. I, I, I've made a commitment to take better care of myself, to get off my medication. I have made a commitment to be more productive, to be more impactful. I made a commitment to please keep a closer contact and build closer relationships with my family and with my friends. I've, I've made a commitment to have more quiet time and exercise and, and doing the things that will indicate that I plan to, to die at young at an old age, taking care of myself. You owe this to yourself. You, you have something special. You have greatness in you. And in order to get that greatness out, only 1% of people achieve greatness. Only to, to do that and have the kind of impact you want to make in the world, got to be hungry. Got to be hungry. And for those of you that want to speak, got something for you too. Got some videos. I want you to go to hungry to speak dot com hungry to speak dot com and I'm, I'm giving both of these away yes why God's been so good to me I'm here because of his grace and mercy and I'm thankful for you you're listening to me for your honoring me with your presence with with your listening to the products that I produce and you're making the dramatic changes in your life as somebody spoke to me and I became a different kind of person. I want to be to you what Mike Williams has been to me. I want to be to you what Mr. Leroy Washington has been to me. I want to be to you to what my mother has been to me. And some of you call me Pops. They, they, they say I'm, they call me Pops now. I mean, you're the oldest one in the group, but my spiritual sons and daughters. Now, when you practice, listen to me, listen. When you make a commitment, if you're serious about your goals and dreams, because I've been reviewing this, when you make a commitment to do what you can, where you are with what you have, and never be satisfied, and be singly focused, focus on something you want to do that's important to you, not to anybody else, that's important to you. And every day you take action steps at the beginning of the year. Why? Because it's easy to be become a victim of weapons of mass distractions. To be distracted, you miss some steps. So I'm giving you something simple and practical to do. Just talk to seven people about your dream. That's all I'm asking you to do. Seven people for seven days, seven days. And for seven days, don't speak anything negative about yourself, about anybody. In the beginning was the word. Death and life is in the tongue. Listen, the book of life says, death and life is in the tongue. Why? Because we speak more death. Speak life, speak positive words. When you find yourself and you slip and you say something negative, say, cancel that. Cancel that. Yes. And don't speak anything negative about anybody else. No, don't do that. Seven day mental diet. When you find yourself, we can't control the thoughts that come in our minds, but we can control the thoughts that we dwell on. Listen to me. This is how I got here. So when you find yourself thinking negative thoughts because of the weapons of mass distractions, let's say cancel that. See, we, we can't control the thoughts that come in our minds, but we can control the thoughts that we dwell on. Talk about how these people can develop their story or, or, or let them know, because I know yes. that there's a lot of people here and we have probably 50 different countries around the world. Yes. Lots of and a lot of them aren't aware of you yet. Yes. Um, but they need to be, right? They need yes. to know about your products and services and coaching and all that stuff. We'll talk about that. Um, your story, you, what, what was the defining moment, that turning point for you that set your life on a different course? Well, what set my life on a different course was when my mother became ill. Mm. Because I was a state legislator in Columbus, Ohio. 
I'm adopted. I was born in a poor section of Miami, Florida called Liberty City, an abandoned building on the floor with a twin brother. I'm telling you my story. And when we were six weeks of age, we were adopted by Mrs. Mamie Brown. I feel like Abraham Lincoln who said, all that I am and all that I ever hope to be, I hope to my mother. My mother was a domestic worker on Miami Beach. She, she cooked for families. We ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. We wore the hand-me-down clothes of the children that mama kept. And so as a child and goal, a turning point in my life was seeing my mother work so hard. I said, Eric, when I become a man, I want to take care of my mother. I want to ask you, is there someone that you want to take care of? Is there someone that you'd like to do something special for? I want you to think about that person. Now, what I've done by doing that, I have segued for my story. I have now brought them into the story and I asked them, is there someone you want to do something special for? They're saying yes. Now, that is called an imaginative leap. They leap from my story into their own story and say, yes, I know somebody. I like to do something for my coach or for my minister or for my mother or my father or the aunt that raised them. Okay? So now they're in the story. Now I will tell them how I went about doing that. So they have an interest. Who are you? What do you have? I have a story on how I bought my mother a home and why should I care? The reason you should care is that I've been very successful at doing something that you can do too. And I'm going to show you how to do it. So now you create a committed listening and the telling of the story. Or I can say, you know, uh, recently I went to a seminar, a young lady by the name of Pauline Ahi. She came to the seminar. Pauline flew from Hawaii to Los Angeles. I was very inspired as I watched her. And the reason I was inspired, here we were in a room of entrepreneurs and the person standing in front of the room, Dr. Julie Van Putten, as she was speaking and talking about discovering your power voice. Ever so often, Pauline would lean forward and she'd pick up a pen with her mouth and she would write with her mouth. Pauline came from Hawaii. Pauline has no arms. Pauline has no legs. She writes with her mouth. Here's a person who decided to become an entrepreneur, who decided to build a business in multi-level marketing. And with no arms and no legs, she's building an organization. And one of the things that, that really got me when Dr. Julie Van Putten interviewed Pauline, she asked her, tell me one major obstacle you had in your life. Tell me something you can think of. And Pauline looked and she thought and she said, I can't think of anything. And that that grabbed me because I could have given a whole lot of things, a list of obstacles. And that showed me that that Elsie Robinson was right when he said things may happen around you and things may happen to you, but the only things that really count are the things that happen in you. Even though she was born with no arms, no legs, what has happened in her that she sees herself as an empowered person. She has not decided to become a part of a job the journey of the broke. She decided to control her own destiny by being involved in multi-level marketing. And what I said as I looked at her, if Pauline can do it, I know I can do it. And I know you can do it. <laughs> so there's a story. How many more you got? Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Yeah. So those examples, I mean, Mike Jones out yeah. of Philadelphia. I met him. Mike was earning uh, $500 a month on Social Security. He now earns over $35,000 a month, and he does a seminar call, how to earn over $200,000 a year with your eyes closed. He's been blind since he was 10. <laughs> okay, so all of these examples of what we see, other people's lives, we can use that as as, as a platform to- so Whether it's your story or somebody else's somebody story, else's that's the example story. that you're giving. Yes, and people you can, say- People say, I, I don't have success it. yet. Yes. You're yeah, just getting started. I haven't had success. I've been involved for six months. I haven't had success. But I can tell this other story and I can say, that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. Dexter Yeager, who was a beer truck driver. Mm -hmm. And now 50% of Amway volume comes through his organization. Mm -hmm. Dexter was just an everyday guy who decided that he wanted to live a, li a different life for himself and for his family. And so when we look at people who are the great performers in multi-level marketing, here's what I know that they have in common too. Not only are they great storytellers, but there was a deciding moment and that moment when they said virtually, I've had it, I've had it. That, that, that's, that's, that's when people change. I used to live next door to a lady named Ms. Lillian and Mr. Marvin every Friday night, he would get drunk and beat her. And I saw her years later and said, how's Mr. Marvin doing? She said, I left him. I said, why? She said, I'd had it. I'd had it with Marvin beating on me. That's when people leave jobs and they say, well, where are you going? Away from here, I've had it. <laughs> You know, I was working on a job where they, 
they, they, they paid me just enough to keep me from quitting and I worked just hard enough to keep from getting fired. <laughs> so finally, I said, you know what? I've had it. Going where I'm celebrated rather than tolerated. I've had it living and playing small. And so those kinds of examples and that kind of passion, people are not just looking for information. They're looking for personality and passion. They can get information on the internet. There are no secrets out here. You can just Google everything and find out what day the earth, the earth was made in the dark and the rock that broke the lion's jaw. We can find everything right now. But personality and passion, that's what people want. That's what they buy into. Do you believe this? The difference between being in this business and this business being in you. That's what they feel. And the people that, that grow the large organizations, you can tell being in their presence that as much as they have chosen this, they were chosen for this kind of work. You've got to have a passion for people. You've got to believe in the product. You've got to believe in the industry. You've got to believe that you have it within yourself to become an entrepreneur, that it's possible that you can live your dream. That's why people say yes, that it's necessary and that you are the driving force to make it happen, that it's you, that nobody can do it for you. Nobody's going to care more about your dream than you. And that it's hard, that easy is not an option. And when you think about growing your organization, think it not strange that your family, family members and friends will say no. People who should be there to help you won't help you. In fact, they will discourage you. They will laugh at you. Oh, you're involved in some pyramid scheme. Here you go again. All of that's going to be a part of it. When you get on an airplane before they take off, they say fasten your seatbelt. Why? Because you're going to experience some turbulence before you reach a comfortable altitude. When you get involved in multi-level marketing, fasten your psychological seatbelts. Why? Because you're gonna experience rejections and no and laughter and snickers from your family members and friends. Why? I don't know, that's just the way it is. It's possible you can live your dreams in spite of that. It's necessary for you to know that you're the one to make it happen and that you become selective of people that you bring into the business. You don't want to convince people to do it because person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. You want people who want more, not people who need more. And that it's you, you've got to be the driving force and it's hard and it's worth it. Decide now, write down five reasons on why you won't give up. Five reasons when you're facing the rejections and the no's when people don't show up at the parties, when people don't keep their word, five reasons why you will stick in the game. I have a saying when life knocks you down, try to land on your back because if you can look up, you can get up. Your reasons will help you get back up again. Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, you can endure almost anyhow. So it's possible you can build an incredible organization, make a great living for yourself. And it's necessary. You, If you're casual about your dream, as Bill Bailey said, you will end up a casualty and it's you and it's hard and it's worth it. And once you create that momentum, it's done. Stick a fork in it. It's done. <laughs> so it's possible. Yes. The second one. Yes. And the reason it's possible, what's possible for one is possible for all. If yeah. anybody built an incredible organization, went across the stage and, and got a check because of their work and their effort, then it's possible that everybody seated there as witnesses can do it. Right. And that it's necessary. It's necessary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you got to have a game plan. You got to be willing to stick it out. You got to be willing to persist. Uh, Art Mandino said, "You got to be willing to say, I will persist until I succeed." You know, the greatest salesman in the world. And and you got to say to yourself, your mantra, no matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. Because in the beginning, things look real good, right? And then you have a dry spell, and right. then you start questioning yourself. That's what over eighty-five percent of people do. And it's you. You got to take yeah. personal responsibility. You're going from being a volunteer victim of letting somebody tell you what time to be to work, how long your lunch break will be, what time to get off, how many days you can be sick out of the year, how many days you can go on vacation, you got to ask for permission. You're going from that position of powerlessness and, 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 and being weak because most people have developed an addiction to powerlessness. That's why the majority of people you ask to come into this business will say, no, they have developed an addiction to powerlessness. When you work in somebody else's job, they are controlling your financial future. So you are different. You are not common. You are uncommon when you so said yes to stop, the Yeah, stop for a second. An addiction to powerlessness. Yes. I, I've never heard it said that way. I think that's really interesting the way you say that. Because we have, we've been taught. Been we've been groomed and, and, groomed, and yeah. taught to depend on a job, to look forward to a job. People looking for jobs in an economy where jobs are shrinking. 
We cannot produce enough, enough jobs, the government cannot produce enough jobs to replace the jobs that are being eliminated through technology and cheap labor abroad. I can get a PhD in the Philippines for $500 a month. When I was a kid, I used to work in a bowling alley. They knocked the pins out, we jumped out and we straightened the pins back up. Somebody invented a tray that put us out of business. They used to work on the elevator. What floor, please? And I would punch the elevator. No, no, they don't need that now. When I was in school, my girlfriend said, I want to be an operator. When you made a long distance call, you call an operator. An operator placed a call. Now you call direct. So technology is changing things replacing whole industries. When the last time you went to the store and bought some envelopes and a stamp and some stationery and a pen to write a letter? We don't do that now. We text, we email. That's an industry that's eroding. I went to a school, Bill Gates School in Philadelphia. They don't have paper, all computer, a paperless school. That's different. When I was a kid, we carried books in school. So this is the era of the late Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity and tremendous competition. What we have in multi-level marketing is cooperation and collaboration. People working together in a community of achievers to help everybody win. Mm -hmm. That's the exciting thing, that, that, that when I help you win, then I win also. You will also have there a two-hour coaching about powerful speaking. Yes. What can we expect from that? In the, in the seminar, I'm going to be teaching people a strategy that will allow them to develop and discover their power voice. There are three things that I do as a speaker that no one else does, and, and, and the people that I've taught have used it, and they've gone on to, to build uh, multi-million dollar businesses, to advance causes that they believe in in their communities. Um, they've been able to, to make a greater impact nationally and globally. And, and what I'm going to teach people that's very different than what's being taught around the planet, one of the most important and, and largest organizations that's been teaching people how to communicate is the Dale Carnegie course. And one of the, 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 the principles they teach is tell them what you're going to tell them, talking about the audience, tell them and then tell them what you told them. Well, my, my training, and that's a very great course, and I admire them and the work that they do. My training goes just the opposite. And when I train speakers and the people that come into the seminar, I'm going to teach you how to conduct communications intelligence. I will teach you the value of never let what you want to say get in the way of what the audience needs to hear. And that in all that getting, get understanding. Find out who they are and then craft a message using stories, statistics, and experiences, special moments that will transform the audience. Because when we speak, the strategy that I will teach you how to implement is uh, distract, dispute, and inspire. How to speak in a commanding way that will distract people from the story they currently believe about themselves. Through the strategic delivery of your message, cause them to back away from the possibility blindness that's keeping them stuck, and then inspire them to begin to take on new challenges in their lives, to get out of their comfort zone, because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. Distract, dispute, and inspire. People who come to that training will learn how to apply that in their presentations to grow their businesses, to influence people, to inspire audiences, to bring the best out of people, to challenge people to take their lives higher. About your goals, I bet you have achieved many goals in your life. Yes. Uh, what is your next goal in life? Well, my goal is to train globally 10,000 voices. These are messengers that will provide a global impact locally and internationally. 10,000 voices of hope. When people have hope in the future, that gives you power in the present. That's number one. Number two is to expand the skill set. There's no shortage of money or opportunity. There's a shortage of capacity. And so expand the skill set of people so that they can be you so they can begin to use all their abilities and their capacity to, to be able to make a greater impact with their lives and to galvanize and create communities of greatness. I believe that we all have greatness within us and that as we learn the methods and techniques of being in a perpetual state of discomfort, 
all of us will be able to discover things about ourselves that we don't know right now and to live from a place of greatness and taking greater responsibility for what we want out of life. Henry, it was George, George Bernard Shaw said, the people that make it in this life look around for the circumstances that they want and if they can't find them, they create them. That's living a life of contribution. It's being responsible and living from a place of greatness. How would you respond when someone's back is up against the wall they're facing failure failure time and time again. Let me just share a little quick story. Years ago, I worked with Tony Robbins. In 1999, I was working with Tony Robbins. I thought, model one of the best. It was either you, Stephen Covey, or it was Tony Robbins. And at the time, Mike, I had a little connection into Tony Robbins. So I went with Tony Robbins. Yes. And I got so pumped after a year of working there, I gave over 240 presentations. What a great training opportunity as I traveled the country and just was able to present so many times. And finally, he said on stage, talking about living your dreams, he said, when would now be a good time? He told the 5,000 people audience. And I remember I nudged my wife and I said, that's my... That's my calling, man. I, I, I'm making an excuse for myself. It's time for me to go live my dream. Anyway, long story short, I left the Tony Robbins organization. I called my parents. I said, Mom, Dad, can we and the kids stay at your home for just a couple months as I do my first seminar? Our other home, our home was actually rented out at the time because we were traveling so much, so I couldn't go there. And Mom and Dad said, absolutely. Well, those two months, turned into five years in the basement of their house. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh. And in my darkest moment, I took, my wife says, you should go get a job. I said, but my, I hear Les Brown in me, right? My calling is to do this. I, there's gotta be a way. I can't just give up on the 10 yard line or whatever. And she said, well, what are you gonna do? And I said, honey, I'm gonna go write a book. And she said, you're gonna do what? You're gonna, do you, have you even read a book? Anyway, I said, I'm gonna go write a book. And we had a car repossessed, so we ended up with one car. And I decided I can't write where the kids are. So I drove down to the grocery store parking lot and I started to type. And two months later, if you think you can, was, pub was written. And I'm telling you, it was published about three months later. And from then, my world in 2005 turned overnight. That book became an international bestseller back in 2005. And we just came out with the, with the 15th version. It's coming out next week. And so it's, it's just unbelievable. As I have always told audiences, believe in yourself, believe in your dreams, figure out the right strategy, but never, never give up. I don't know, how, how do you counsel people to respond to those kinds of challenges without giving up? Well, first of all, we always have a choice. There's something in us, TJ, as you know, that's greater than anything that we face, even though we have no evidence to point to, to prove it. Like as I'm speaking to you now, that's right. I have to prepare myself mentally because I'm, in pain as I speak to you. The cancer has eaten 40% of my T1 vertebrae and metastasized to the T2 to T3 and to the C7. Uh, and I, I just spoke to an audience this morning and I said, a doctor looked at me and, and, and he said three words that no one ever wants to hear. He, he said, you have cancer. And the audience got quiet and I said, sir, can you give me a second opinion? He said, yes. And you're ugly too. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I said, no, I said, I got issues. I got issues. <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. So I could have said, and I, even now I could say, this pain is just too great. But my affirmation, to myself, whenever I'm going through a tough time, and I'm a 27 year cancer conqueror, no matter how bad it is, or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. And I think that people who make it through the storms of life, and we're always going to have storms, 
Forrest Gump said life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. My book of life says that think it not strange that you will face the fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might. You will have tribulations. It's called life. And so what's key is to visualize and see yourself on the other side and, and hold that vision. He said, I'll give you all your eyes can see. Hold that vision and say to yourself, wow, that came out great. I made it through. I learned some things. Every day for 27 years, I've been saying, I thank God I'm cancer free. And people say, wait a minute. You've been saying that for 27 years. I mean, obviously it's not gonna happen. I said, no, that's not true. Number one, I'm still here. Augmentino say, persist until you succeed. Well, just think, 27 years, look. When will a baby walk? It will walk when it walks. When will it talk? It will talk when it talks, and some talk sooner than others. And so many times we give up out of frustration and lack of patience. And to me, the people that make it through have a series of, of, of perseverance, persistence, and patience. And they show up with that every day until they get the desired results that they want. I know, there's not, I don't believe, I know that I'm going to be free of cancer, that this is not a, unto death. There's something that I have to align myself with because cancer cells have gone crazy. And so as I'm working on myself and working on the goals and dreams and other areas of my, my life that I have not resolved yet, that I'm just persistent and I'll keep coming back again and again and again. And as I told my children, even a broke clock is right twice a day. <laughs> A <laughs> brother's going to break through. <laughs> that, is, that is so awesome. Despite your the cancer challenge, if you call it a challenge or not, um, you're it's still out. Because you get to know things about yourself that you don't know. Yeah, All right. That it introduces you to a part of yourself that you're not familiar with, that it helps you to begin to prioritize things and determine what's important, what's not important. The things that I would get angry about that I just let pass. For instance, I was coming down the sidewalk yesterday when I arrived here in New Jersey, in Philadelphia, and a guy had his luggage on the sidewalk and he saw me coming. All he had to do was just pull his luggage back so that I can come by. He refused to move it. He's standing there with his wife. And so, which meant that I had to move my luggage and carry it into the streets and then get back on the sidewalk. And so he said, good, I'm glad you did that. And I said, thank you. And I got into the, the car that was waiting for me. And I said to my friend, I said, you know what? <laughs> there was a time that I'd have whooped his ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I wanted to look at him at one time. I said, you about to make me lose my mind. Up in here, up in here. I took my stuff on the sidewalk, and that wasn't enough. You wanted to taunt me. You wanted to tease me. You, you want to act like you punked me out. And I said, but at 74, no, because every emotion, I mean, I laugh a lot. Why? One minute of laughter boosts your immune system for over 24 hours. Think about that. One minute of laughter boosts your immune system for over 24 hours. So people who are watching us now, after we get through, they will get sick for 20 years. <laughs> one minute of laughter of, of anger weakens your immune system for four to five hours. Yeah. So I deliberately don't get angry. I choose not. Anger is a wind that blows out the lamp of the mind. I study psychoneuroimmunology. I know that the, the thoughts that we have, they create gene expressions. I know it creates a certain type of chemistry in our body that's toxic. And so I can't afford, as, as, as a cancer conqueror, to get angry. I choose not to go there. And, and we always have a choice. And I believe that uh, the type of program that you have, it gives people the mental and emotional and, and, and psychological and spiritual muscle to have a clarity of mind to stand back and say, you know what, I'm not gonna go there. I, I, I'm not gonna let this get to me. I'm better than this and rise above it and move on with their lives. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you for sharing all that. I, uh, you said, you, you put a little nugget in there I like, which I wanna draw attention to. 
but she just said some people give up on their goals because they lack patience. And that made me think of the law of the harvest, which has three laws, right? You reap what you sow. Yes. Increased returns. You get more than you sow, right? right. And then the third thing is delayed gratifications. And so sometimes we give up on our goals um, because we haven't given time for those seeds to, to nourish and bear fruit, right? We give up a little bit too early. And I, anyway, any thoughts on that? Yes, well, there are some things that you're pursuing. I, I see that, that we grow from people and from projects. I'll be a better person at the end of this program because of our communication. We grow mm. from people and projects. And so when we have projects, they challenge us. Why? Because we always, if we want to grow into a serious, choose projects that's beyond our comfort zone. Because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. That's good. And so there are experiences that you're going to have in the process. Some things will happen to you and some things will happen for you. And so I believe that those things that happen for us that sometimes we're aware of, but most of the time we're not. That's what psychologists call your scotomas, your blind spots. Right. That a, a, a lady, she's an intuitive and she, she wrote me a note when she found out that I was a 27 year cancer conqueror. And she says, this is not unto death to you. She said, search your heart and find out what's there because, and she was one of the people that gave me a book years ago that I read called, Who's the Matter With Me? Mm -hmm. And what I realized, TJ, and this is the first time I ever talked about this publicly, that uh, somewhere in me that I had not consciously recognized that I had anger at my birth mother mm -hmm. and father. How could you bring someone in this world who didn't choose to be here and walk away. And even though we are told, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. I woke up in the middle of the night and sometimes you can get a message from a movie. Right. And a movie with Tom Cruise as Carl Magnolia. And I never saw the whole movie, but the, there was a quote that woke me up around 3.15, and I never forget. And the quote was, we might be through with our past, but our past is not through with us. And so I have unresolved stuff in me because for a period of time, I saw myself as being, have been given away, but there's been a shift in my consciousness. Now I look at my life and I realize I was chosen with love, that God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And that's why I know now that I've come to grips with, now that someone, I had to get some help, but I believe ask for help, not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong yes. and ask for help and don't stop until you get it. And I said, you said, this is not unto death for me, search my heart. And I said, can you help me go there? And she did, because sometimes somebody can take you to a place within yourself that you can't go by yourself. And in that session, I realized the anger and, and the hatred that I had for two people that I, I, I don't even have faces for. I've never seen my birth mother, a birth father. And, and so I had to resolve that. I had to forgive myself first and then forgive them. And that's when the healing takes place because cancer a cells gone crazy. Yeah. And so now as I move to a place of love, God is love and he who dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in them. As I move to a place of love for them, that, that now I'm in harmony and in integrity who, with who I am as a person and I have forgiven myself, I've forgiven them, and I'm living this mission of making the world a better place than how I found it, of being a source of light and hope and inspiration for people. And you're doing an awesome job. There is no long-term benefit for being a grudge holder um, 
holding resentment toward people. I always tell people, the people say, well, do things bug you? Well, things bug me, but listen, yeah. I don't, I don't live there. And I always tell people, I let things roll off my back. You can criticize me all day long. And you know what? I'm not going to internalize that. Yes. Right? Because I know who I am and I'm thankful for who I am anyway. Yes. And, and that is real because the stuff we take on is, is, is that hating someone is like drinking poison and, and, and say, okay, now you're going to die. <laughs> no, it's not going to happen like that. Yes, no. We, we all need coaching on how to let some things go. One of the things that I teach is let go or be dragged. That there are certain things that you know that you need to let go of. Otherwise, it's going to compromise your power and it's going to drag you down. And you got, it takes time to do that. It does. It does. So in your book, I remember this story. Yeah. Such a great book. Anyway. Um, you walked in, I think it was to a junior high or an elementary school, and you said, there's greatness in this room. If you're here, would you please stand? Yeah. And you had to say it over <laughs> and over. And then yes. one one young person, didn't they stand up and they said, here, here I, I said, am. Yeah. Here I am. And that young man, I'm working with him today. Oh, you're kidding. No, he's been with me since that time. He, he is an attorney and he also worked with youth. We go to prisons and juvenile detention centers together. Yes, and he's truly manifesting his greatness. And I'm proud to say I'm one of his mentees because it's a seesaw relationship. At first I started out being his mentor, but he has an incre incredible skills with the millennials and with technology that I don't have. Oh. And so he's teaching me how to connect with them and how to use technology to further the work that I have, that I'm doing, and to create non-performance income. So this thing called life, I believe that you, you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. And he's teaching me and I, I'm proud of it.